welcome back to this series of tutorials by FlingOS. In this tutorial, we will be looking at memory. This will include basic understanding of what memory is, the concepts of physical and virtual memory, types of virtual memory, including segmentation and paging, and lastly, how to configure the x86 for using paged virtual memory to create a higher half kernel. In the previous two tutorials, we looked at how to compile and link both C and C Sharp. In the future, all examples will be provided in both C and C Sharp equivalents where appropriate. Thus far, we have also developed a basic kernel which boots, initializes the processor, jumps to C or C Sharp, and then displays a color to the screen. In this tutorial, we will be discussing various bits of theory, which will explain some of the processor configuration code which I previously didn't explain. We will also end by extending our code to make our kernel a higher half kernel. What this is will be explained later, but it is useful to know now that it is widely considered very useful for design considerations later on, particularly when you start developing multiprocessing code. Let's take a step back for a moment to look at what memory actually is. Memory is essentially any method of storing data. When we say memory in relation to programming, we generally mean two things. Firstly, we mean that the data to be stored is in ones and zeros. Secondly, we usually mean RAM, random access memory, as opposed to hard disk, which is also a form of memory, often referred to as storage because it's a form of permanent storage. RAM is a form of temporary storage. RAM gets its name from the fact that you can access any individual byte at random. This is unlike a hard disk. Hard disks generally have a specific format, meaning you can't just store data at random. You can only access 512 byte blocks at a time. RAM memory has no specific layout or format, except for the first one megabyte on x86 processors, but that's a discussion for later. So by memory, we mean random access memory. RAM nowadays consists of flash memory sticks which are connected directly to the motherboard. They have very fast access times which is why they are good for loading programs and executing them from there, and for temporary storage of data. RAM memory stores data for as long as the motherboard is powered on, and it doesn't receive a reset signal. The fact that it is temporary is also a factor in giving such good performance. What probably seems obvious nowadays is that a byte in RAM is 8 bits in size. This is true for all RAM nowadays. However, there are still some systems in the world that use 9 bits to a byte when transmitting data. For example, some serial connections, so be careful. The 9th bit is often used as a parity check. Modern PCs and laptops usually have 8 to 16 gigabytes of RAM. However, the system we are developing is a 32-bit operating system. This means the number of bits for addresses to RAM is 32. This gives us 2 to the power 32 possible bytes to access. If you calculate that, it comes out at 4 gigabytes. So how do we access the other 4 to 12 gigabytes? The answer is you can't. That's why 64-bit systems were invented. We will note later that there is a technique using virtual memory to allow a 32-bit system to access more than the 4 gigabytes of RAM. But under a 32-bit system, no single thread or process, including the kernel, can see more than 4 gigabytes of RAM at any one time. I've made various references to virtual memory, so let's go ahead and look at what this is and why we might want it. What we've been discussing and using so far has largely been physical memory. What this means is that if you have an address to RAM, when you read or write from or to that address, the actual byte in the physical hardware can be found at the position given by the address. Virtual memory adds a layer in between the processor and the physical memory. This layer is a transformation table. When you read or write from or to an address, before going to the physical memory, it goes to the transformation table. In the table, it looks up the address you supplied. It uses it like a key. What is returned is a new address, the new physical address. So the address you supplied can point to almost anywhere else in physical memory. You can even have two virtual addresses point to the same bit of physical memory. It's also possible to make a virtual address point to nowhere. This causes an error if you try to read or write that virtual address, which can be useful behavior. Before we go ahead and start looking at translation tables, 
and virtual memory in detail, it's useful to understand why we'd want it. A relatively simple example is if you have two programs running simultaneously. For security purposes, you don't want either program to be able to read or write the other program's memory. Note that a processor can only actually run one process at once. It just switches between them very quickly to make it seem like they are running simultaneously, assuming we are talking about a single core processor. So when one process is running, it maps only its memory to valid addresses. All other addresses map to nowhere. This is where the exception functionality mentioned earlier is useful. If the program tries to access anyone else's memory, not only will it not be able to access it, but an exception will be thrown to warn the operating system. This allows the OS to stop potentially harmful programs such as viruses or buggy programs. Let's take a look at types of virtual memory. Translation tables come in various formats. The two major ones are called segmentation and paging. Paging is by far the more prevalent in modern PCs, however, x86 still requires you to understand and configure basic segmentation. This is because of legacy software and design, which uses segmentation. Furthermore, the world of embedded processors still makes use of segmentation for smaller devices, because it's lighter weight, in both hardware and software terms, allowing lower power consumption. One thing to remember is virtual memory also comes with various security features, such as allowing addresses to point to nowhere, and other methods of restricting which processes can access certain addresses based on so-called privilege levels. Segmentation essentially works on allowing you to mark custom size and custom located areas of memory as being translated by a fixed offset with certain permissions. Generally, there is a limit on the number of areas, known as segments, that you can create. Segments can also overlap, and overlapping segments can have different sets of permissions. Paging essentially works by splitting up memory into four kibibyte blocks, and you provide permissions and a translation address for every block. You have to provide some configuration for every block in the address space. A block is called a page. So why not use segmentation? It sounds like it might be a bit faster and easier, right? Well, yes and no. There's a lot of history behind this, but essentially segmentation has three major issues. Setting up segments, from a time perspective, doesn't scale very well. Large segments traditionally take a lot longer for the processor to set up. Segments span a variable area of memory, with no subdivision. Most operating systems use swap files to store the memory of currently paused programs on the hard disk. This involves copying the memory of the program to the hard disk via a disk driver. Because there is no subdivision of segments, this means copying the entire segment to disk. The purpose is to free up the physical memory for currently running programs to use. When a program which has been swapped to hard disk starts running again, its memory is copied back from the hard disk to physical memory. As a result of the variable size, lack of subdivision, and use of swapping, the physical memory becomes very fragmented. This means there are lots of segments with small pieces in between. The spaces are so small they cannot be used for a whole segment. This results in a lot of wasted physical memory. Often so much that even if there is enough physical memory space in total for all required segments, there isn't enough in the virtual address space. As a result, paging is now the only widespread virtual memory system. Most operating systems, even on x86, rely solely on paging and only set up segments because they have to. We will discuss the x86 in more detail later because its system of combined segmentation and paging is unlike any other system. I described above the method of swapping segments to and from the hard disk in order to free up memory. This creates the illusion that there is more memory available than there actually is. Paging has a similar system, but instead of swapping segments, you swap pages. Pages are smaller and of a fixed size, meaning it's easier and faster to swap them to and from the hard disk. Also, because pages are small, you can often load things like libraries into some pages and then the main programs into other pages. Programs which use small libraries, formerly known as shared libraries, for hopefully obvious reasons, 
can be paged out without the libraries. This is unlike what often happens with segmentation. This means paging uses less hard disk space and is faster. We now know a bit more about the two main types of virtual memory. It is safe to assume everything from now on will be based on the paging system. We will only have to return to segmentation for a short while later when we look at how to configure the paging on the x86 processor. So how does paging get set up? What controls which pages are used for which programs? And what controls the process of paging things out to the hard disk? This is called memory management. It is performed at various levels in a full operating system, both by the kernel and programs themselves. But we will concentrate on the kernel level stuff. To keep things simple, we will ignore paging things to and from the hard disk, partly because that would also require us to have a hard disk driver, which we don't. We will also ignore the programs and drivers. We will concentrate only on what the kernel has to do to manage the memory for its own use. Under those conditions, therefore, memory management is a fairly simple concept. You just need two methods, one which can be called to allocate a block of memory on request, that block can be variable size and is not necessarily a page. And then you need one method which can deallocate, known as free, a block of memory. Lastly, you may need two methods to set up a new virtual memory page or remove a virtual page, if you run out of memory for allocating blocks. What I have basically described is a heap. A heap is a large chunk of memory, often spanning multiple pages, hence the need to add or remove pages. From the heap, you allocate small blocks of memory for things like objects and structures. The heap is separate from the stack. The stack is usually allocated from memory that doesn't overlap with the heap. There are many ways to manage a heap. Each method has its advantages and disadvantages. Usually the faster or more efficient, in terms of fragmentation over time, an algorithm is, the more complex it is, and often uses more memory to keep track of information about the heap. Slower algorithms are simpler and easier to understand, but are less efficient and slower per request. Given how frequently allocating and freeing memory occurs, a small increase in heap speed can have a huge increase in overall operating system performance. Now allow me to confuse you a little more for a minute. Memory management and managed memory are very different things. Despite their names sounding similar, they are not the same thing at all. Memory management is what I have just described. Allocating and freeing blocks of memory. With memory management, you return a pointer to the exact block of memory you allocated, and that's it. The program can use that pointer directly and free it again later with one call. The memory management program has no idea what the memory is being used for. Managed memory is rather the opposite of this. Managed memory is not used by C, but it is used by C Sharp. Under managed memory, you do not return a pointer to a block of memory. Nor can you request just any size block of memory for whatever you want. Instead, you provide the memory manager with the type of object you want to create, and it allocates a block big enough for that type of memory. It then returns you a managed pointer, sometimes called a reference, which has a record of the object's identity. When you want to access the object's memory, you call the memory manager with the object's identity and the memory manager looks up the current location of that object in memory. It then finally returns that to you for one-time use. Under the hood, the memory manager can work out when an object is not in use and then relocate it in actual memory. This allows it to reduce fragmentation. The memory manager also keeps track of how many references there are to an object. When there are no more references, it frees the underlying memory block. You don't really need to understand managed memory right now, so don't worry if you didn't fully understand all that. Just be aware that memory management and managed memory are not the same thing. We are looking at memory management. Okay, so let's look at x86 page memory system. x86 has a lot of history, and as a result, it has a weird combined system of segmentation and paging. The upshot is that you have to configure segments which cover the entire address space and allow everything to access that address space. Paging then sits within this so that there are pages covering 4 kibibyte blocks across the entire address space. 
In a previous tutorial, I provided you with code for setting up the GDT, the Global Descriptor Table. The GDT is the thing which allows you to configure segments. The code I provided you with already contains segments which cover the entire address space and allow both kernel, ring 0, and user mode, ring 3, programs to execute anywhere in the address space. Here is a brief visual breakdown of how the GDT and segments work. So we've configured the x86's segments such that the entire address space can be read, written or executed by any program of any privilege level. Now we'll look at how we can identity map parts or all of the address space. Identity mapping is when a virtual address maps to the same physical address, i.e. the translation is zero. First we have to allocate memory for a complete set of page tables and the page directory. The x86 uses a two-level structure to break the 32-bit address space into four kibibyte pages. Here is how the x86 uses the page directory and tables to translate a virtual address into a physical address. So to map a virtual address to the same physical address, we must create a page table. Set the relevant page table entry so that the 4 kibibyte page is identity mapped, and then add that page table to the relevant page directory. Lastly, we must tell the processor where in memory the page directory is. Note that the page table and page directory addresses must be in physical addresses, not virtual addresses. Otherwise, the whole thing would be indefinitely recursive. A page directory consists of 1024 entries. Each entry consists of 4 bytes and has the following format. A page table is pretty similar. It also consists of 1024 entries, each 4 bytes in size. A page table entry has the following format. From this, you should be able to realise, or calculate, that if each page table entry covers 4 kibibytes, then a complete page table covers 4 mebibytes. And of course, the complete page directory covers 4 gibibytes. Using your knowledge of Assembler, C or C Sharp, you should be able to write simple methods for configuring identity mapping. Have a go, then compare to the following sample code. At this point, you may be thinking that all of this is rather slow and cumbersome. To an extent it is, and for that reason, processors such as GPUs often don't have a virtual memory system, since accessing physical memory directly is faster. However, for day-to-day -day processing done on the CPU, we should be willing to sacrifice the tiny amount of performance for the vast increase in security. When you get further with your operating system and start looking at multiprocessing or multi-threading, you're going to love having virtual memory set up. That's not to say though that Intel and AMD didn't bother improving the performance of paging and hardware. There is one key piece of hardware you need to know about, which is incorporated into the processor, but can trip up a lot of new OS developers. The particular processor feature in question is known as the TLB, the Translation Lookaside Buffer. It is often also referred to as the TLB Cache or Address Cache. This cache is accessed prior to the page tables when the processor needs it to access a virtual address. If the virtual address is already in the cache, then it just uses the physical address that was last loaded into the cache. If the virtual address isn't in the cache, then it is a cache miss. The processor then uses the page tables to look up the physical address, then adds that to the TLB cache for that virtual address. There are several consequences of this. The main one is that when you change the page tables in any way, 
you must flush the cache of any and all virtual addresses which you changed. The second consequence is cache misses become a significant performance factor. Utilizing memory such that you minimize cache misses can significantly improve overall performance. To clear the TLB cache for a particular page, you need to invalidate that page. This is done using the invalidate page instruction. Note, this is a case where you have to use assembly code, either in a raw ASM file, or in inline C, or as a plug in C sharp. For the last part of this video, we will look at how to use identity mapping, a link script, and proper virtual mapping to make our kernel a higher half kernel. A higher half kernel simply means the core kernel executes in the top half of the virtual address space, typically Nortex C0000000. The bottom half is reserved for drivers and user mode programs. Our operating system is loaded physically at a low address. Using virtual mapping, we can map the high virtual addresses to point to the low physical addresses. However, there are a few little complications we must deal with. These are, the compiler and linking put what they think are physical addresses in our code. We need to trick them into putting the virtual addresses in the machine code so we can just execute in the higher half without any complication. However, the second issue is that the processor starts executing our code with virtual memory unconfigured. So all our code prior to virtual memory being enabled, including the virtual memory setup code itself, has to be able to execute using physical addresses. Thirdly, we also don't currently know how to get execution to jump the long distance between the low half code, where the operating system will start, executing under physical address mode, to the high half code, where the OS will begin executing under virtual address mode. Tricking the compiler and linker is pretty simple. In our link script, we just need to tell it what address to use as the base address. By default, it uses zero, or occasionally other values depending on context. But we will override this value to use Nortex C0000000 as the base address. We will also tell it where the code should be loaded physically i.e. just after the first one mebibyte. For all sorts of historical and practical reasons, the first one mebibyte of RAM is reserved at startup on the x86 processor. It is used for peripherals like the display. Modern PCs have so much RAM, it's not worth trying to free the first one mebibyte, so we just work around it. Once our code is being compiled to the high half execution, we need only modify our existing assembly code that handles the initial boot, to account for the difference between the virtual address that we compile against and the physical address we will know it will actually have when it's running in memory. Because there is a fixed difference between the virtual address and the physical address, in our case, Nortex C0000000, we can just subtract the difference from each address we use in our code. Lastly, we need to configure sufficient mapping that our code can run both in the low half and the high half, and perform the jump from low to high. Once the kernel is running in the high half, you can turn off the low half identity mapping, just don't overwrite the low half of physical memory. Ok, so here's the code for mapping the low and high halves. It should be reasonably clear. This next bit shows how to do what is called a long jump which forces the compiler to do an absolute jump from the low half to the high half. That's it, our OS is now running in the higher half. Go ahead and recompile and test it in your virtual machine. In the next tutorial, we will look at how to configure and use interrupts, in particular, using the timer interrupt to do something at a periodic interval.